everyone this is sonali thank you all for carving out some time for attending today's webinar on the episode 6 of the business x learning series which is all about creating value in your business to all the attendees out there please type in any questions you might have in the q and a section and we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end of the session request you to keep the questions within the scope of today's discussion and not to your personal business queries Uh, I would now like to welcome our speaker, Mr. Gorup Maria, Chairman and Founder of the Franchise India Group. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Sonali, and uh, welcome, friends, and welcome to another edition of uh, Business X uh, series. We talk about three things uh, uh, in different episodes. Uh, one is investing, second is scaling, and third, how do you value your businesses? And we do it uh, every every week. Uh, one topic on investing, one topic on scaling up, and one word about value. This is now the sixth episode, and last time we talked about value, and this today also I think we are talking about the value. It's a value series. Uh, value is building value in your business is very very important, and and our perspective at Business X and at Franchise India Group has historically been for especially for small and medium enterprises because we understand the community very closely. We worked last twenty three years in that community. and i understand that how how different is the mindset uh, when it comes to small and medium enterprise to versus large companies large companies always thrive to build value in their enterprises and that's where the the the, the organizations uh, behave and and do and design and when it comes to small and medium enterprises is absolutely different they, their mindset is very income centric so they're driving incomes but things are changing faster than you know uh, because a lot of uh, external pressures are coming on companies Uh, businesses are changing uh, for various reasons uh, people have to look at their businesses for from a different perspective now and also i think in this changing times a lot of people want to move out of their businesses they want to resell their businesses some are looking to really uh, come out of the businesses and add uh, get some value out of it a lot of reasons are coming in where there is a there is a need for you to really discover a value in your business and also i always say that even if you run your small and medium enterprise continue to assess your value and continue to assess your value because when you start assessing your value you will actually start knowing where the business is going and how how business is is you know inherently designed you know and sometimes we run our businesses which are not so efficient and and there is no inherent value been built but we keep running and we just keep managing our cash flows we get into this kind of a life cycle where we just managing the business for sake of it and and have a little bit of residual incomes which survive us and i think that becomes your practice of life and then you continue to run that practice i have seen in my lot of my businesses by i start asking myself why i'm doing it you know end of the day you don't run businesses to just pay checks uh, or pay your rentals pay your things and and just have small income on that unless and until you are building businesses which can tomorrow create value for you and that's where uh the real uh, form comes in so today's uh, th next 30 odd minutes are are designed to really discuss about that so let's go backward in terms of what we discussed last episode on value because a lot of people are joining new so they would have not come so last time we were trying to put a foundation of what is the value and how you really discover value in your business and one of the simple answers you know i don't want to look at confusion in 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 terms of how value is been looked at to me a firm can have a value only if ultimately it delivers earnings you know so one of the key reasons for enterprise to really look at value is eventually where is earnings going to come from it is eventually going to be the profitability of the enterprise not necessarily at the given time now it can be in a future cycle it can be 3 years 5 years 7 years but eventually the earnings potential of that business model uh, over the time for the stakeholders uh, uh, that would create the inherent value and how it is consistent how it is dependable how it is predictable all these measure would really define how this uh, uh, business is to be valued so we also understood that a valuation is just not about a scientific practices a lot of uh, uh, you know professional valuation professionals are very scientific in their approach in terms of picking up your bottom line uh, and doing some multiple and some finding of some some uh, comparatives and so on so forth and they come up with with the, some kind of value to me a valuation is a is a combination of an art and a science uh, relatively sometimes the art is more dominant in some sense uh, than rather than uh, the science part of it especially look at now you know at this stage if i have to look at a business from a valuation view point i always look from a 
a perspective of a buyer, you know, because a buyer at this stage has many choices. And why would he look at your businesses and why would he play, give you a valuation that would become a very, very important. This is a, this is a buyer's market, right? At this stage, everything would change. Another thing which changes is also the valuation cycles. Uh, what times of economy we are living in. Now, let's look at the current times where there's a lot of pressure for people to sell their businesses or exit their businesses or uh, sell uh, entire thing. But there are not many buyers out there, not many liquidity out there. So it, this is a, it is, I would I call say, a depressed cycle. At the depressed cycle, the valuations would also change. So eventually, I would look at valuation as a, as a structure of uh, how you really want to. So we went last week uh, uh, on, on the value uh, front in terms of how uh, uh, people should look at when they're thinking about valuation, how they should really look at it. Then we also talked about basic things on your valuation, how to define your asset. You know, how do you really go deep down in your asset and define that? What is your tangible assets in the system? What are your intangible assets in the system? What is your liabilities currently sitting in the system? Uh, what is your financial matrix? Uh, so all these are a combination. I call these four different pillars. And how do you really bring those together and try to understand what, where is the inherent value? Another very important method is uh, I have realized that whenever you approach a, a valuation professional, uh, you know, they, they always reach your objective. You know, there is a, I mean, I always call the valuation they are more quantitative where valuation itself becomes an objective. Fundamentally, is that you set in a mind that this is a value which I, I see for my business and then all the numbers, you try to stack it up to that, which means that you put the projections, you put the earning levels, all that needs to be done. So sometimes, this, especially the future valuation are more objectively driven than uh, really historic performance driven. So we set an objective and, and try to do that. And that's where it changes. And a lot of, uh, when, when we reach, especially when I have been approached by a lot of, uh, especially these startups, when they come in, and present their valuations and present their uh, business models. I, I, I don't get it sometimes, you know, and, and I feel that uh, these are always designed for a certain objective already set in a mind and they've designed their uh, financial modeling according to that. So this is more, more quantitative in nature rather than uh, going depth by the depth of historic performance. And, and it's right because a lot of startups don't have a historic performance. So they, they put some lot of assumptions in their uh, business models and, and on that they base on their entire thing. But, my principle of valuation, which I use in a very simple manner, I divide the entire business. I look at a business from three perspectives. Uh, these three perspectives to me are very clearly uh, three different inherent value in sitting in the, in the business. Uh, one is the subscriber value, which is me. I call the SAS principle, SAS principle. The subscriber value is that what is your current customer base and what is the life of that customer continue to purchase with you. So that to me is a very important value and especially the consumer businesses, what is their subscriber value, where it is coming from. Second is more reasonable to understand from a balance sheet is your asset value. What is an asset deployed uh, in the business model? And third is the, what is the strategic value? What is your, I mean, if I have to look at an asset to acquire or buy that out, what is it giving me? It's giving me some kind of a market share, go to market capability, some, uh, some talent being available there or any other strategic location which is there or some licenses, some contracts which are sitting as a strategic value in that entire thing. So between these three things, I would place my valuation. So I will, assets are more definitive in nature, which means that I would know the real value in terms of what is an asset value. But the other two, one has to do judgment. And today's discussion, we will, we will talk about these two more than the asset because asset is very clearly uh, seeing the balance sheet and you can read it out. But you are not able to find a real genuine subscriber value. What is a subscriber telling you and what is the current status and what is the future status of that subscriber value? And also from the strategic value in terms of how do you really find the strategic value? And most of the time, the strategic value is lying in the uh, what I call non-tangible uh, uh, assets and what kind of intangible assets particularly. Uh, so they, they put a lot of constitute, a more, more, lot of the strategic value in the business. But few questions one has to really answer, and I will put across these questions. How predictable is your cash flows in the future? What is the predictability of that cash flow? Second, how do you improve your margins, hence profitability? One of the areas I've seen that companies discount their future performance and, and their uh, profitability doesn't increase because the margins are not capable to increase going forward. So I will feel that a lot of people actually have done mistakes in, in raising capital uh, and defining these future cash flows. And most of the time disappointed, they are not able to meet the, the revenue guidelines or the projected guidelines. 
purely because they never had real answers on how their profitability or margins would continue to increase. So fundamentally, the problem in India is that with big inflation keeps hitting you, your margins don't increase, and the performance which you predicted on, on a bottom line three, five, four, five years rather becomes more bleak. So how do you really have a structure where you were able to demonstrate uh, to an investor that there is a, a larger, uh, uh, there is a predictability in your improvement on the margins? What is your sustenance and stability in the performance? Another big reason is that when you predict three to four year, five year, and most of the young companies or small and medium enterprises actually have to do uh, a future valuation uh, structures, how do they really predict the stability of their business model? Because uh, next three to four years, five years, the business would not only grow, but would be very, very stable and sustainable. How do you do that? What is your founding team? Who is the team brand running and tapping and how stable that team is? And it's not only the founders, but the key management team. And how do you lock them in? And that's very important. Currently, I've seen most of the investment, especially in the early stage or a small to medium enterprises, people would only do when they see a very strong management and founding team. Uh, what is your competition inside and outside? Uh, their influence and threat to your business. When I say inside, I've seen a lot of co companies have failed because they're, they're the key guys have left that company and created another competition. Is there any risk of internal competition? Is there a risk of external competition? Uh, there is a new competition, which is now, which is called the invisible competition. These are called the disruptors and disruptors come from changing the way consumer actually bought anything, right? So sometimes that competition to me is, is, is invisible competition. This is becoming even bigger now that, uh, you know, you, we have to really see through, is there a product or a service you own which can be disrupted? Uh, there can be in three to five, 10 years, something can be done which can absolutely change the way people consume and so on and so forth. So all these areas are uh, very, very important for us to understand. <clears throat> so today, I think we will go into a little depth of a couple of things and, uh, and I will, I will take you through uh, <clears throat> some of the areas which are very important for us to understand. So apart from the economic value uh, with the businesses there, we have to really see that what other things in, an investor would always look at. I always believe that uh, whenever people look at, they always look at the current status of the business and the current status is largely around what the brand stands for, what the brand is talking at this stage. Uh, and brand is just not about the logo or the symbol. It's, it's, it's it has to stand for something much larger. So what is the brand stands for? What is your customer goodwill today? Uh, how many customers you have? What kind of goodwill you enjoy? What kind of loyalty they give it to you? And so on. Second is your internal uh, uh, resource structure, which is your employees, their satisfaction, their commitment level, uh, their continue to be excited about the growth of the organization. Sometimes you have a lot of uh, I mean, vintage in the, in the team and they are very commit uh, running there, but they're not so committed in the growth of the organization. So these are two very different things these days. You know, fundamentally, it's not about the aging of people with you. And rather, if you really see people, teams which have performed for a four or five years committed to each other, but they were very com clearly committed on the growth and the vision of the founder. Uh, just having people doesn't make any sense. Rather, a lot of companies have actually eroded value because they've, their employees have aged and they have no commitment to the growth of the organization. So employee satisfaction is one aspect of the business, but overall their commitment to growth is much bigger aspect of the business. So one has to really see where it is coming from. Your supplier uh, relationships, how locked they are. I mean, there are a lot of companies invest into like, look at McDonald's, McDonald's, any market they go, they have three or four or five key suppliers and they actually go with their McDonald's everywhere. And they're so committed, they have large part of the 60, 70% of their dependability comes on McDonald's. How dependent your suppliers are on you. So they would really put the best to the entire thing. All good organizations, all good companies uh, would have a very strong uh, supplier commitments. How they are, you know, if you're not in the first five priorities of your supplier, then it might be, they, they might change, they, they might change the pricing, they not take you on a priority and things like that. And that's exactly what happened in this crisis in last four or five months. Uh, because the production levels went down because of labor issues, other issues, lockdown issues. So people actually serviced only three or four uh, top clients of theirs. And I, I would see that would change a big uh, change in the entire thing. So the companies like Mother Dairy, Nestle's and likes of them really continue to support. And a lot of these micro companies, which were also buying, uh, got disrupted because their supplier commitment was not there. They were buying from the same suppliers, 
uh, this product, but they were not able to get that because their commitment to them was very, very poor. Your overall operational capability, you know, how seamless is your operations today and how defined it is and how, but especially when you are looking at an m &A kind of an opportunity, I think uh, integration plays a very important role, how this gets integrated and integration is not only the culture, but operational capabilities and how simple your operations is to be taken over. That also sets a value. If I, I see something which is very complex to take over, uh, then there is, there is also a difficulty in that. Then there is a Uh, commitment levels uh, for the current entire thing, your operational capabilities today, and what is your social and community value for your enterprise. And that's also very important these days, how do you really do that. But apart from that, there is also a future value. You know, future value, how do you really see three, five year, uh, years from now? What is the future going to look like? How diversified your consumer base is going to be? How you really spread the entire thing? And people like this diversified consumer base. There are companies like Mahindra, if you really see how, how diversified their consumer base is, they, uh, it's, I mean, look at their portfolio on the automobile side. I mean, they are one of the largest suppliers to defense, they are largest suppliers to government, they are suppliers to a uh, lot of these, uh, you know, uh, specialized vehicles, which are e more utility, state, urban development and likes of them. They are big time invested now on uh, public transport and they are also passenger car manufacturer and they are also uh, commercial vehicle manufacturer. So they were diverse in their uh, portfolio. Even if for that matter, a disruption comes from one thing, they might get defense going up. They might get their this own note. So how diverse your consumer basis, how a recurring revenue that is sustainable and resistance to commoditization, which means your, your product continues to have certain amount of premium and advantage. So you are able to intact your margins rather than getting the risk of commoditization. How good your improving cash flows are. How we can really see that your cash flows are continued to do that. How do you demonstrate your scalability uh, in the business model, scalability to new markets, new products, and uh, new channel. Uh, these are three things which I have to be demonstrated in every, uh, if anything which needs to be scaled, you need to really see through from three levels of growth. Uh, what I call uh, new markets, new products, and uh, new channel. So if you are able to define in your business that these three things would continue to happen, you know, one of one company, which is Maruti has demonstrated at one time, all three, uh, and that's where they disrupted the entire automobile share in the country when they launched Nexa. So they got new market, which means that they brought a new product and absolutely, uh, Nexa was a new brand and, uh, and they went to a new market, uh, and then new target groups, new products, they launched multiple products for entire thing, and then created a new channel also, which means that Nexa dealerships were next to Maruti dealership and they stood next to each other. And they created another full channel uh, base of Nexa. Between the, because they impacted all three growths, uh, there was an absolute uh, a big change in their market share. And uh, overnight, uh, Suzuki overnight revived their uh, market share, rather they gained before what they were. And because they demonstrated all three uh, growth platforms. And finally, what is your financial forecast and controls? How you are able to forecast your financials and, and your controls over the business? Because uh, you know, sometimes the business goes out of your control. Now let's go into uh, why people value businesses and why they want to really uh, value uh, businesses and what is the larger purpose of valuation. And there, these days there can be multiple purposes and purpose has to be understood before we even begin the, you know, the process of valuation, because unless we know the purpose, uh, we will not be able to understand purpose and urgency are two very important aspects in, in, in the, in the, the thinking process of your valuation. So business valuations uh, can be used for different purposes, largely market consolidation, market consolidation or market share consolidation. Does it uh, overall, uh, you know, financial and retirement planning, you, you might be looking to exit the business because you don't want to continue. It can be because of taxation purposes, a lot of consolidation people do or acquisitions happen because of uh, taxation. Uh, there can be now you know, huge uh, uh, valuations are happening because of the bankruptcy, restructuring, litigation, a lot of these issues are happening. But a lot of people are also, especially small and medium enterprise, because of the, uh, you know, reasons of diversification, looking at people moving into some other businesses, 
they all valuing their businesses and they are looking for exiting their businesses and one of the areas which business x really works on is helping companies to value and then find the right buyer so whenever you really look at a uh, business valuation you always look at a three different approach and one what i call the market approach second is a very income approach and third is a cost approach and these are only three approaches which is uh, used by any form of uh, uh, valuations when you look at uh, now let's understand what is a market approach market approach is very simple you know it's normally uh, is very comparative kind of a structure where you you would set a say a privately business and you map it with the a publicly traded company so you essentially would do a comparative uh, and comparative market pricing and sometimes you will also see the last transactions happened on the entire thing so if i was selling a food business i would i would one compare it with domino being a listed company and what kind of uh, earning levels they are running on what kind of a uh, valuation they are sitting on while their public companies are differently valued but i can still get some is uh, comparatives on that but i can also value in the last acquisition happened by a comparative brand in the market so these are very clearly uh, driven from a uh, market approach how do you how markets have approached and what kind of a uh, structure they have the second uh, methodology is always about income approach methods <clears throat> income approach methods are um there are various methods but the most common method is obviously discounted cash flow mechanism how do you really do that but there are other methods also what is what capitalization of excess income method there is a capitalized income uh, economic income method so there are different methods but most of them especially on the smaller bit i think it's based on discounted cash flow method where you will forecast your earnings for next 3 5 years and then discount that uh, uh, earning levels and create a uh, valuation for the business and this is most commonly used uh, in in all the valuations especially for uh, small to medium enterprises and they would always uh, use this kind of a method and the third is, approach is very clearly the what i call the the cost approach model now the cost approach model is essentially to really understand what is was the cost to build this up you know it's very cost plus model is is very asset centric what what it took to build this up and if i say invested into a factory which costed me to build 3 crores and and if it is depreciated in structure level i will come with the cost plus uh, cost plus model in terms of doing it it is also can be done from a replacement model which means that if i have to do the same thing today what it cost me right and that's also comes in these are more fair value uh, to be arrived for uh, more asset based businesses where uh, you would take this kind of approach this approach is also done a lot of time in smaller industrial units a smaller uh, uh, industries where people would look at this from a perspective of uh, that if i have to do this again what would it cost me and if i am getting this uh, a little cheaper than what market would offer and then there is a bargain on that so this is very conventional approach people would do that a lot of transaction where even the uh, uh, valuation professional is not there but now we is required to get any transaction done on a i mean because it's required by uh, the regulator but a uh, lot of transactions in the market happen on on this approach so there are three approaches in the business just to give you clarification one is what i call the market approach the income approach and the cost approach depending on that most of the uh, startups and early stage companies would always look at the uh, discounted cash flow uh, uh, approach that's a more income approach how do you really define your incomes over over the years and try to see what kind of valuation is to be done and most difficult is to really assess that because uh, most of the times there is a lot of variance in that and how do you really capture that variance both from a buyer and a seller view point now let's understand uh, you know because a lot of our our clients are franchise companies and uh, businesses which don't have too much of tangible assets they have a lot of intangible assets and and they come to us and and look at evaluation a lot of time people ask me also that if i am running a franchise network uh, is it good to run a franchise network broadly very hypothetical question i always say that how your business is performing would give you the valuation uh, people don't want to know how much you invested in the stores and so on and so forth they want to know how your your bottom line is and how you run your own stores or you run franchise stores so but let's talk about a little bit on the intangible assets part of it intangible assets franchises it can be your trademarks patents good uh, copyrights 
any kind of goodwill you sit in the business any kind of a contracts which you have signed any kind of securities you have so any thing which which has been a part and very important uh, uh, you know uh, asset which is which not physical but it is important say maybe a contract you have uh, which which has a five year earning potential or 10 year earning potential you have a software which has been developed which is at a uh, which is very important for the company so all these become very strongly the intangible assets and especially in the knowledge space in the knowledge economy or the information economy these assets would become much more and most difficult to really assess and put a valuation to it there are different methodologies people use one is a <clears throat> what i call the a double R, uh, rrm method which is a relief from royalty method now this rrm calculates value which is based on hypothetical royalties that you would be saved by owning the asset and rather than licensing it say for example you had a software now you want to value it uh, so you need to really value if i would have to take this software on license what kind of uh, monies i would have to pay for next 5 years or 7 years and that. there can be some kind of a uh, uh, intuitive value which would come out of uh, uh, this entire thing there always would be a intuitive value you need to then compare that this is this is worth for you or not worth for you and so on so forth there is another method which you use is called what i call wwm which is with or without method which means you you do both projections of uh, the discounted cash flows over 3 5 years one with these assets which you want to really value and one without it and then see how does it really reflect on entire thing and then you can take a call there is also a lot of optional uh, rights which means that you can put op uh, put option which means that you want to really take that asset at a certain stage uh, you would have you can exercise that entire thing so a lot of people don't take all this uh, pieces and some companies have not taken i mean they've acquired businesses and they've not even taken the uh, brand you know in say in cases like uh, hutch acquisition vodafone never acquired hutch as a brand and they created their own brand called vodafone a lot of these cases companies would not acquire uh, uh, some kind of uh, intelligent assets and the third method is also which is called the replacement cost method which is the method requires an assessment of replacement cost of the intangible asset with a new one which means that if you have to replace this uh, with a new uh, thing which means rather than your old software if you have to buy a new software what is the cost of that replacement depending on these methods you will be able to find what is the value of the uh, your intangible asset value <clears throat> so these are so today uh, idea was to cover really to go in the foundation of valuation and then uh, pick up a little bit on the tools of valuation three different approaches which we talked about and also talked about how the intangible valuation it needs to be done so this is for today i have to keep it short because i have to run for another it was uh, planned uh, uh, at 3:30 so so thank you very much i i i thanks for uh, continue to joining us on business x series next week we have a income series how a uh, investing series so how do you invest into businesses or new assets we'll continue to do every week either on invest scale or value and if you have a questions you can reach out to me directly or uh, sonali uh, and uh, i will give my email id gorom maria gm@gorommaria.com i apologize for a little rush today because i had something which is uh, uh, planned for a couple of weeks and it happens to be 3:30 so uh, so i have to rush for this entirely but next week we'll do a full one hour uh, session on invest and we'll also do a little bit recap on on what we have done in the last six episodes